All right, folks, the word of God is alive and powerful. Yes, it is. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirits and the joints and the merit is it what? It is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Yes, all scripture is God-breathed, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the study of God's word through the technique of rebound and operation cry, if necessary. I'll close out our prayer time and pick up our study right where we left off last Wednesday. Father, one day at a time. Each day brings more trials, different trials. Good things happen. This is just the way life is. We have to orient to your plan, to your purpose, your will for our lives. In this scenario called human life, human history, bringing to us from all sides, good things, bad things. The question is, how are we going to handle all this? Well, this morning, we're going to get a good look at what the old sin nature is really like. And Father, we're going to use some words here that are just normal English words. That because of educational background over the many years, I believe the people that are online with me this morning will understand. But the truth is, the younger generation is going to have a hard time understanding what we're saying because we have, because of such a small vocabulary. So as we open up your word, Father, to get a glimpse into our lives, by way of David, by way of Jeremiah, other biblical characters, telling us what life was all about in their lifetime. You look up and say, huh, how's that any different from what it is today except just different people? But that's the, way, that's the way life is. And I know that you're encouraging us on every front to live according to your plan. Why? To honor and glorify you, to resolve the angelic conflict, to bear to ourselves Blessing in time, reward in eternity, developing capacity in this day and age to suffer and to receive blessing. Oh, capacity, it's a wonderful word, Father. The question is, how much capacity do we have? How do we get capacity? Well, we're going to learn some things this morning, Father, and get a good glimpse of our lives on the front end of our study. May the Spirit of God teach those who are willing to listen to your word in Christ's name. Amen. Let me just remind you that this coming Sunday, we will uh, we will have our second post COVID, meaning that the the doors are opening up. Uh, Bible conference fellowship lunch at American Pie Pizza on Maumel Boulevard at ten o'clock from ten to twelve thirty. I'm going to send out an invitation this afternoon sometime today. And when you get it, as soon as you are able to know whether you're going to be able to attend, please get me that information. Now, one more thought. Our beloved friend, Chaplain uh, Steve Haynes, lost his mother. Uh, she departed for, uh, for heaven. Uh, and uh, they are in the process of preparing funeral services, arrangements, that kind of thing. And so just be in prayer for them because uh, at this point in time, with all that's still going with uh, going on with COVID, uh, there's limitations to things that are we're able to do. So just be in prayer for the Haynes family. Uh, at this point in time, Chaplain Steve is is a great guy to his family. Uh, he's uh, he's on top of this and uh, realizes that his mother's with the Lord, and one day 
they'll all and we'll all be together again. So listen, thank all of you who have written, logged on with me this morning. And let's get into our Bible study. And listen, I'm so grateful when I look up and see who's online uh, with us and I uh, can't see uh, Facebook. But for those who are online with us and knowing where you are, um, other parts of the world and uh, some on vacation, but logging in or uh, at some other uh, some of the things going on. And there they are uh, every time the, the, the door is open. Uh, Joey, I thank you for being with me today. God bless you, pal. So let's uh, let's pick up with our Bible study because this is going to be a, another good one. It's going to be helpful. Remember, one day at a time. This is the tenth lesson, an hour and fifteen minutes at a time. And as we began this nine, ten messages ago. We said that there would be nine major points to understand concerning one day at a time. Take a look at your life. What do we mean by one day at a time? Well, point one, by way of review, point one indicates that time is a, log or is a logistical grace provision for the believer. Now, we're focusing on you, focusing on me, focusing on people who are, in fact, born again believers. Now, what we want to do is take a look at this thing and see what does, uh, what does this word time mean? Well, when you read the definition for time, time is the indefinite continued progress. The word indefinite. When you're born again, your time frame starts. That's one day at a time. The moment you're saved, your one day at a time begins. And the question is, what are you going to do with that day that God has given you? Now, we know that early on in our Christian life, there is no, uh, there's no doctrine. We have no doctrine. And so the question then is, how are you going to live if you don't have any doctrine? Well, the, the way you're going to live is to go to Bible class, get the information so that you can grow and make a, make a, uh, and benefit from that one day that God gives you. Now, one day is 24 hour period of time. But the word time here indicates that logistical grace. See, God has placed you in the angelic conflict at the moment you were saved. Well, actually, you were in the conflict from the moment you were born. But you went to the front line of battle the moment you were, you were born again. The question is, how are you going to fight against an enemy without any provision, without any, without any, uh, without any armor, without any weapons? Well, that's logistical grace, and God's going to provide them for you. So know this. That from the time you were saved until this day and until the day you die, one day at a time, past, present, and future, right up to today, is what we mean by time. Second point, in the days provided, one day at a time, from the time you were saved, be, being provided by God's logistical grace, he's making supplies, he's giving you the weapons, he's giving you the armor to battle every day in the angelic conflict. And the days provided one day at a time by logistical grace, only the days, now listen to this, only the days that you are in fellowship with God. And this is why I want to tear up, T-E-A-R, I want to tear up. Like the Apostle Paul, when he looked out and saw his, his, fellow, uh, his fellow Jews who were going to temple, they were going through all the motions. They were legalistic to the core. Oh, they were, they were doing what God wanted them to do. They just didn't understand what all this meant. So when you look out today and see the number of born-again Christians across the United States, listen, I'm not, I'm not badgering. I'm not maligning. I'm not complaining. I'm not criticizing. I'm giving you an objective analysis of what's going on in our country today across the country as far as Christianity is concerned, and you ask yourself, how many believers today are receiving the unadulterated, inspired, inerrant, and fallible word of God from an ice method, isagogically, categorically, and exegetical teaching to exposit the word of God so that we'll have an idea of what it means? Just yesterday, my wife and I had the pleasure of meeting a person in uh, a local restaurant who was serving us only to find out that this person is in fact a born again Christian. I, that, that's not unusual, but this person was a born again Christian and we had an opportunity to fellowship 
around the table of your word while we're sitting at the table having lunch. But this is not this is not the norm of this day. So in the days provided by logistical grace, only the days that you are in fellowship of God. Now you know by now that being in fellowship of God is not just rebound alone. It is not just confession of your personal sins. That's where it begins. But see, those sins are being confessed from your neutral man or your neutral woman because the neutral man or the neutral woman is the person who makes every decision in your Christian life. So once you, your, your neutral man or neutral woman has confessed those sins, all that did was clean the slate. You are not yet back in the green circle in the, in, the, uh, in the sphere of the spirit, and that takes Operation Cry. And when you know, when you have, when you have, uh, when you have reached the point where you don't have to know anymore because you know your old man was crucified with Christ, your old woman, you know that you have reckoned your old man dead to sin. You know that you have a, a new man or a new woman. Now you yield to God the Holy Spirit and bingo, you are in the green circle. You are in the sphere of the spirit where you are to live your Christian way of life. And when you look out and see the number of people who claim to be born again Christians and, and are, that are not living in the and not living in the sphere of the spirit, not not executing God's plan the way He wants it planned. You realize then how many Christians in point two in the days provided one day at a time for every born again Christian. Only the days that you're in fellowship, and if you don't understand rebound, and if you don't understand whoever you are out there, you do not understand Operation Cry. You are not now, nor have you ever been in the fellow in in fellowship with God, except the moment you were saved, until you committed your first sin, and you don't know how to get back in fellowship until you learn the protocol plan. Rebound and Operation Cry, or what I call Operation Recovery. So in the days provided. Only the days that you're in fellowship with God have any significance in the execution of God's plan, his purpose, and his will for your life. Why are you on this planet as a born-again believer? Well, it's to execute God's plan, his purpose, and his will for your life. But if you're not doing that in the sphere of the Spirit, you're simply going through a legalistic process you're functioning from the source of your old man and or your old woman. Under the influence of the old sin nature, you're building up human good that will burn at the beam of seat. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. Now let's look at this. Time is given to us one day at a time. It's the past, the present, and the future. One day at a time from the moment you were born again. Point number three. Days are lost through divine discipline administered to the believer. So when you're out of fellowship with God, God is going to discipline you. This is not punishment. This is pressure in your life of some form or another to get your attention that, the, that your, your life is out of line with God's plan. You may be doing good, but unless it's doing the right thing in the right way in the sphere of the spirit, you're out of God's plan at that point in time. You're not completing his will for your life. You're doing the right thing, but it's in the wrong way. Hence, divine discipline administered to you in the form of warning discipline, intensified discipline, and ultimately the sin and death for the reversionists who progressed all the way to, to level eight of reversionism. So look at this, look at the little diagram and the three, the three bullet points. What I have here is a, a list of, of days. I've numbered the days and I have crossed out, I uh, crossed out some of those days and the line that crosses that out, it means, and that's an illustration of being out of fellowship with God on that day and you lose that day. It's, a, it's worthless to you. It has no significance to you or God in the execution of his plan. See, it is a precisely correct procedure. We call it a protocol plan of God. A precisely correct procedure. So we have day one through day 20. Day one and two, you're okay. Day three, oh, you spent the day out of fellowship with God. You didn't rebound. You didn't use operation recovery. So as far as God is concerned, in the eternal, in the eternal picture, that day was absolutely worthless to you and worthless to God. 
in the angelic conflict. Oh, you walk along four and five, you're doing fine. Now, this is probably like a babe in Christ. You know, you, you're, you haven't learned, you're, you're, uh, you're sinning, uh, you're habitually sinning a particular sin, you didn't know it was a sin, or uh, you're having trouble with this, fighting the, fighting the battle of the flesh. You get up to day six and seven, you know, those, were, those were bummers, you know. It, it didn't do the right thing in the right way. Eight and nine is okay. So as you look down that list, what I've done is I've crossed out certain days to simply indicate that that day is lost to you if you're out of fellowship with God and the days are lost through divine discipline. God, God is disciplining you. He's pressuring you to get the picture that you're walking on the wrong path. Now, here's a comment. You see, the days are lo days lost to divine discipline are crossed out on that on that timeline there. And the question is, how many days were lost due to divine discipline? All you have to do is count the ones that are crossed out. The point is that you need to realize that in terms of God's plan for your life, now just look around again, all around you. Look at Christians everywhere and ask yourself, where are they in terms of executing God's plan, purpose, or will for their life in the sphere of the Spirit, doing the right thing in the right way, and that might answer that might give you an answer as to why we are in the mess that we are in today here in the United States of America and around the world. Point number four. We, we've studied all these. Now, point four, I've just given some illustrations here. The importance of Bible doctrine for length of days. What that means is how what of what value is doctrine to me? Well, the truth of the matter is, if you want to live longer for the purpose of executing God's plan for your life, rather than die prematurely by way of the sin and the death, because we have failed, you have failed as an ambassador for Christ, because in your ambassadorship, that simply means that you have a responsibility to your fellow man and to get to take God to your fellow man out there, not believers, but fellow man, fellow men, you're taking the gospel to them and you're taking the word of God to people that you meet who don't understand what the Christian way of life is all about. So if you want to live a longer life, generally speaking now, there are some exceptions, but generally speaking, if you want length of days, you're not going to get it by living in reversionism. That's why in the diagram there, length of days, I've got a short line for length, uh, for the uh, for the reversionist. What does that mean? Does that mean 30 years, 40 years, 50 years? I don't know what that means, except for the fact it means you could have lived longer had you been had you been a mature believer, had you been advancing in the Christian way of life, advancing spiritually to, toward maximum spiritual maturity. Hey, Lynn, guess what? Mature believer, look at length of days. God says there are you will lengthen your days as it's related to the intake, the metabolization of Bible doctrine, the Word of God. Point number five. What about your days? The days that you have, your days are meaningful and accompanied by prosperity when there is spiritual momentum moving forward in the Christian life and spiritual growth moving from babyhood to adolescence to spiritual self-esteem to spiritual autonomy to maximum spiritual maturity. That's the growth process from, from the moment you're saved until the time you reach maximum spiritual maturity. And how do you do that? You do that through the metabolization of doctrine, and the metabolization of doctrine includes application. So let's go back and look at point five. There's some key words in this, in this, uh, in this point, and I've, uh, I've actually listed them on this timeline. The word meaningful, prosperous, momentum, and growth. So if you want to have a meaningful day today, if you want a meaningful day tomorrow, if you want to look back and see why your days in the past were not meaningful and accompanied by prosperity, and that's not, that's not uh, uh, temporal prosperity, it, it includes that, but prosperity here is spiritual prosperity. That means you can handle everything that comes to you in your day no matter what the circumstances are. And we had better be prepared for the future because the future looks bleak. I believe this, there's still time to turn this thing around for you and me, not just for the United States, 
but to turn this thing around in, in the angelic conflict so that we can maximize our effort for God. There's five people out here, 10 people over there, 16 people back there, one over here that needs to be saved, and God is God's giving us the time to reach out and get that, but it will only be accomplished by people who are doing the right thing in the right way. And that person might be you. So if you want a, if you want a meaningful day, one day at a time, if you want a meaningful day, and you want that day to be accompanied by prosperity, that means spiritual prosperity, the, the, the abundance of blessings that God brings to you. See, the prosperity is the blessings. It might include money. It might include many tangible things that you can see and taste and feel and smell. But much of the prosperity that God has for you, you can't see it. You just experience it. So day, days of mean, are meaningful and accompanied, accompanied by prosperity when there is spiritual momentum. That means coming to Bible class, taking in the Word of God, metabolizing the Word of God, executing it, resulting in spiritual growth from babyhood to maximum spiritual maturity. You don't get there overnight. You lose the battle. You lose a battle here and there. You, you, you gain victory here. And the, the, uh, the more you grow, the more victory that is there, the more capacity for blessing, the more capacity for reward, the more capacity to suffer by doing the right thing in the right way. So days of, see, days of the mature believer, that bullet point there, the days of the, of the mature believer, meaningful, prosperous, momentum, growth. And these are all provisions that come from metabolizing doctrine, doing just what you're doing here. That's coming to Bible class, taking in the word of God, allowing the spirit of God to teach you the meaning of what I'm teaching. See, I'm just a mouthpiece. But when you're living in the, when you're living in the spirit of the spirit, the Holy Spirit, then living in your human spirit, is going to teach you the meaning of what I'm teaching. The light bulb goes on. You add that light bulb point to all the light bulb points that you have received in the past. You have that now down on your on your launching pad, ready to ready to apply to the circumstances of life. So point six, the day by day life of the mature of the believer. The day by day life of the believer only has meaning. Your life will only have meaning when each day is related to biblical to Bible doctrine. as biblical truth. The principles, the promises, the doctrines, the techniques, the rules for living. So the little diagram here, meaningful day of life, day by day, is related to Bible, Bible doctrine. It's related to biblical truth. You don't have a meaningful day. Now, Human viewpoint said, "Hey, I had a great day last. Hey, I had a great day yesterday. Uh, um, the Razorbacks won won the football game. Uh, I got a I got a a check in the mail from from the IRS. Uh, those are that's not what we mean by a meaningful day. The meaningful day is related to the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict when you're doing the right thing in the right way." Now let's move on here because we begin right here in this point seven. Point seven and, and what we're going to see here is what I indicated to you earlier in this program, in this, in this, in this session, that we're going to get a glimpse of what the old sin nature is like. Arrogance is a mental attitude sin. And in this idea of one day at a time, the question is are you living an arrogant life? Are you living a life that is spiritual, experientially spiritual, minus arrogance? You're living in the sphere of the spirit. You understand that arrogance is a sin, and you understand the many, the many faces of arrogance. And again, when you see this, and as we go down through the list of, uh, of, of, of facets, features, characteristics of arrogance, you're going to look up and say, good grief, I didn't know that this thing of arrogance was so expansive. Not expensive, expansive. So arrogance, what's it going to do? Arrogance is going to destroy 
the capacity for the divine provision of one day at a time. See, from the moment you are born again, God had placed in the spirit in your spiritual bank everything that you need. But as you grow in Christ, you're going to grow in your uh, in your capacity to build capacity for divine provision. In other words, as you grow, your God will, is able to pour more of his divine provision into your life. But arrogance, this is point number seven, a one day at a time. So as you're living your one day at a time, and you're wanting to know, how do I live this? Am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? Is, it, is this good? Is it bad? What is it? Well, when you understand what arrogance is, as a mental attitude sin, functioning from the old man or the old woman under the influence of the old sin nature, arrogance destroys the capacity for the divine provision of one day at a time. Now, I was looking for, I was looking for uh, three different kind of jars to give us the idea of different capacities. I, I, would, I really wanted them to be in a reverse order, but I couldn't find them that way. All I could find is the larger one, the middle size, and the smaller one. But if you turn those around and put the pint on the left-hand side and the gallon on the other side, that gives you an, an idea of what kind of capacity that you have when you reach spiritual adulthood, when you reach spiritual maturity. Now, remember, sp spiritual maturity is a, is a straight line. It's a flat line. You're growing in babyhood on a flat line. Then you have that diagonal line that's going from babyhood to adolescence through adolescence, and you reach you reach a spiritual adulthood or spiritual maturity, and that's the flat line, spiritual maturity. Now watch this. In the status of spiritual maturity or spiritual adulthood, you have three levels of capacity. The pint level is when you reach spiritual self-esteem. The court capacity is when you reach spiritual autonomy. The gallon level is when you reach maximum spiritual maturity, and God pours that maximum divine provision into that gallon, and guess what? It just overflows. It overflows in the lives of every person you come in contact with. So there are three different capacity levels, and that's as a result of spiritual growth. Now watch this. Case number one. See what you want is capacity, and each one of those, each one of those jars there, and reverse the order. Now you're going to go from spiritual self-esteem, one pint. You're going to go to spiritual autonomy, one quart. You're going to go to maximum spiritual maturity, one gallon. And what that means is an increase, an increase of your capacity. Your 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 cup is getting bigger, so that God can pour more into your life as a part of your responsibility in resolving the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict by doing his will, his purpose, his plan for your life. It's a precisely correct procedure. Now, it's only when you reach a spiritual adulthood or, or ma spiritual maturity that you actually have these, di these three different kinds of capacities. If you want to, you say, well, wait a minute, I had some capacity when I was a babe and I had a capacity when I was a, 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 an adolescent. Okay, just add a thimble out there. Put a thimble on the right-hand side of the pint. That would be your capacity uh, when, you, when you were growing through babyhood and adolescence. But when you reach spiritual self-esteem, you get your pint jar. And that means that you now have capacity at that level for God to pour. You, he can't pour a quart full in a pint. He can't pour a gallon full in a quart or a pint. You have to have the capacity, and the capacity actually comes from passing the test that God brings into your life as a spiritual adult. Now, case number one, then, is this believer is not arrogant. So in case number one, indicating that the, that the believer, you as that believer, is, you're not arrogant, then guess what? You have capacity on that day. And you're either going to have a one pint, a one quart, or one gallon capacity, depending on what level of spiritual growth you're in. 
And the reason you have that capacity is you're not functioning in arrogance in your life. Case number two, the believer is arrogant. But that means there is no capacity. You sit there with a pint jar, a quart jar, a gallon jar. Generally speaking, this would be the pint, the pint, uh, the pint jar. It's possible that it could be the quart or the gallon, but not not normally. But here you are. You're sitting there, and you're sitting there in your life. You've got a thimble or you've got a pint jar. God wants to pour divine provision into your life for that circumstance you're facing, and He can't pour because you. You put the plug in the you put the plug in the in the pipeline. Remember last last Wednesday, the grace pipeline, God's righteousness and justice. God's righteousness sees your positive lesion. He opens up the, the pipeline, justice opens up the pipeline and pours divine provision into your life. On the other on the other case, God looks down at you with his righteousness. He sees negative lesion. He sees the arrogance of your life. The plug goes into the pipeline, and he's unable to pour any capacity, divine provision for your circumstance of that life. See, it's a precisely correct procedure. Angelic conflict. So what is arrogance then? If arrogance is such a destructive force in our spiritual life, then what is arrogance, and how can I identify it? Well, this is why I indicated earlier, again, that with a with a a limited with a limited vocabulary today as a result of a failure in the field of education perhaps not in your life but you better open your eyes you better take a you better take a wide look you better look at the horizon and this is not painting with a with a you know with a, a big a wide brush it's not it's not painting in a, in a wide manner no, this is an objective evaluation. When you understand what has happened in the educational field today, and all educators weren't failures, but generally speaking, education is failing. One of the things that one of the things that the um, that the progressives early on in the field of education indicated: don't do not teach. Are you listening to me, please? Please listen to me. The progressive forces early on in the in late 1800s, the early 1900s, when they were dealing with a a philosophy of education, the progressive indicated that you do not teach children to read at an early age. That there are other factors that need to be featured, and you know what it was. You know what that feature was. It was the assimilation of the races, bringing the races together to be able to to be able to uh, to get along better. It was the socialization of the races. Believe me, if you don't believe me, go study it. This is the this is the the kind of thing that has destroyed in part this nation, and why it's so difficult today for you. I don't care who you are. Whoever you are, it's difficult for you to go out into the street and, and, and proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. This is why there are multitudes of organizations and people who are trying to shut our Christian mouth. And so when you're trying to teach something like, hey, you know, if you want a fellowship with God, you're going to have to get out of this arrogance bit here. And when you begin to look to find out what arrogance is and the many faces of arrogance, you're going to find words, you're going to hear words that, oh, I've heard that before, but what in the world does it mean? And if you don't know what it means, you couldn't identify it if it hits you in the face. You couldn't identify it if it was right in front of you. And maybe couldn't even identify it in your own life, especially if you have a trend toward asceticism as a bleeding heart do-gooder. You don't understand arrogance. You, you, and you see what you're doing, you feel so good about yourself. Well, let's take a look at this. What is arrogance? How can I identify it? Well, first of all, arrogance is lofty self-respect. Now, that doesn't say you, you need to have self-respect. But lofty self-respect goes beyond the limit. So arrogance is a lofty self-respect, totally apart from reality. So here you are, here I am. I think, whoa, boy, you can't. If people only understood who I am and what I am, oh my goodness. 
But see, that's not reality. When you take a look and find out who you really are, that's not reality. So arrogance is a lofty self-respect going beyond the, the, the boundaries of respect. And it's a, totally apart from reality. Arrogance is also high esteem of oneself from some imagined or real superiority. Hey, I used to play professional baseball. Oh, I see. Uh, you didn't make it into the in the you didn't even make it into the little league. Well, you know, here I am. I, I play professional baseball. You know, I I used to work with the FBI. Yeah, as arrogance is as high is a high esteem of oneself from some imagined working with the FBI playing baseball doesn't make me superior to anything. Or maybe it's real. Hey, I did play baseball. I did work with the FBI. But that doesn't mean I have a high, I ought to have a high esteem of myself. Even though it's real, I did. So arrogance is high esteem of oneself from some imagined or real superiority. Arrogance is the antithesis of grace, God's provision. What is grace? Grace is God's provision. Well, God's not going to provide. If you're arrogant, remember, you have to be in the sphere of the spirit for him to pour. So arrogance is the antithesis of grace, God's provision. Arrogance blinds the believer to the grace of God. Hey, I don't, I don't need the grace of God. Look here, what I got over here. That's your human viewpoint. That's your human effort. You don't solve spiritual problems with worldly with worldly tools. So arrogance is going to blind the believer to grace. Why? It's because I have this high self-esteem, lofty self-respect. And just knocked, it just broken the quart jar. It's broken the pint or gallon jar. Arrogance is also synonymous with vanity. Well, what is vanity? Vanity is empty pride. Oh, I'm so proud of myself. Look what I did. Yeah, I hit a home run. I did this, I did that. I fixed my own flat tire. Oh, look how good I am. Now, arrogance is synonymous with vanity, which is empty pride in regard to one's person, who I am, attainments, what I've done, possessions, what I have, coupled with an excessive desire to be noticed, a lust for attention, Lust for approval or praise from others. Now, by the way, there's there is a great illustration here, and that has to do with being a member of Facebook. Why do people post things out on Facebook? Well, there's several reasons, but I wonder how many actually post something out there to get 500 likes. 2,000 likes. Well, last week I only got five, but hey, things are getting better. I got 10 today. See, that's just an illustration of, of something like this. It's just one of many. But arrogance is synonymous with vanity, which is empty pride in regard to one's person, attainments, possessions, coupled with this excessive desire to be noted. Woo, look what, oh my goodness. And you start posting pictures of yourself and all these kind of things. What you did, where you're going. Oh, I'm so proud. A lust for attention, a lust for approval or praise from others. Well, what is arrogance? Arrogance is an inordinate. What does that word inordinate mean? It means excessive. Arrogance is inordinate or excessive pride in oneself or one's achievements. Excessive self conceit. Arrogance is behaving or looking as though you think you are superior to others, but you're snobbish and you have contempt for other people. That may not be you, but look around and see what, what people are like all around you. See, we have a responsibility to people. We have a responsibility to ourselves, and we have a responsibility to others. Arrogance is a complex. Now, that word complex means a term that consists of many different parts. Sometimes it, you'll have an apartment, com an apartment complex. It may, be, uh, it may be five apartments. 
joined together. That's a complex. It might be a multi-story building, each floor being a part of the complex. Well, arrogance is a complex, a term that consists of many different parts of sins like the following. So when you're talking about arrogance, and this is why I indicated we're going to get a good look at ourselves, we're going to get a good look at what uh, Christians are like, we're going to, uh, to get a good picture of what life is really all about. And here it is. What is arrogance? Well, arrogance can be jealousy. So if you're jealousy, arrogance equals jealousy. Are you jealous about anything? Somebody has something you wish you had, but you can't get? Bitterness. Listen, people today across this country, bitterness is bitterness is rampant. It's rampant. And bitterness is often found in the lives of born-again Christians, bitter against about what is happening out here in life. You think everything is, you think everything is wrong, you're on the right track, and, and you may be. But you're not on the right track if you're bitter. This is why you have to understand that God is in control of these circumstances. And you say, well, I don't like God then. I, if, if, if God's involved in all this, I don't. Listen, God has a purpose in all this. It doesn't make any difference how bad it gets, how much worse it gets, how much better it gets. You understand God is in control. You can't change it. The thing, only thing you can change is you. You, you. Bitterness. Wow. Vindictiveness. Hmm. Then I'm, I'm going to get back. I'm going to get back at you. You do something to me, I'm going to get back. Yeah, well, you hit me, I'm going to hit you. You do this, I'm going to do that. Vindictive. That, that can be motivation. Motivation to be vindictive. Implacability. This, uh, this is the person, this, this arrogant person isn't going to change no matter what happens. They're implacable, they're unbendable, unbreakable. You can't change them. That's arrogance. Arrogance is revenge motivation. I'm going to get even. I'm going to get even with you. Listen, it doesn't make any difference what happened to you. Yes, it, it, in it, yes, it, it makes a difference. But not for revenge. Getting even. God saw it coming. He allowed it to happen. He's made... Go up there and get a pint jar full of his of his um, provisions for you. Maybe get the, get the quart jar. Get out of get out of the thimble full. By taking in the Word of God, growing, applying the Word of God, you have momentum in your Christian way of life. You have capacity for more of His divine provision. Capacity for uh, capacity for suffering, capacity for blessing, all as a result of Bible doctrine and growth in your life. Revenge motivation. That's just a, that's an attitude. It's not just vindictive here one time. This uh, this, this is my lifestyle. I'm going to get even. I'm going to get even. How about revenge modus operandi? That means you are operating. Your whole life is about revenge. That's the way you operate. See, that's arrogance. What does arrogance do? It destroys capacity for God's divine provision. Self-pity. I just can't believe I did that again. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. There you are, just sitting around weeping all day long. All about me. Self-pity. Poor me. See, that's the poor old me's. That is not the Christian way of life. That's arrogance. Arrogance is not just outward. Vindictiveness, that's outward. Revenge, that's outward. Self-pity, that's inward. Conceit, so conceited. Inordinate ambition, it's not wrong to be ambitious, but what do you, what do you want to be ambitious about? So when you're, when you're the, the seeking, whatever your ambition is, seeking that to the exclusion of God, to the exclusion of his word, to exclusion of your daily life, that's inordinate, it's excessive. To be competitive is not wrong. 
I'm told that, that personally that I'm competitive. But you, to have a competitive nature is not wrong. It's when it is inordinate, when it's over and above board. And just because someone sees you as being inordinate doesn't make you inordinate. God lets you know when it's inordinate. But being ambitious, being competitive is not, it's not wrong. You can be in the sphere of the spirit and be ambitious. I am ambitious to be the, the greatest Christian that I can be. I'm competing with myself to become all that God wants me to be. It's a battle between the flesh and the spirit. I want to be battling and competing on the on the on the sphere of the spirit side, the new man side. What about slander? Slandering, saying bad things, mean things about somebody. Good grief, just take a look and see what's going on today. My goodness. Thought that's going through my mind, even Christians slandering one another because, you know, uh, I'm not a Baptist and, or I am a Baptist and you're not, and I'm a Catholic and you should be too, and I can't believe that you, that, just a second, I just got to change the tape here. Bear with me for just a second. Okay. Slandering. All of these are all of these are are arrogance, okay? Gossip. Talking about somebody when you need to be be quiet. Well, you know, I'll tell you what, uh, listen. Probably the, the easiest way to gossip and not know it is to say to somebody, I want you to know something. We need to pray for so and so. Well, why do we need to pray for them? Well, because he has been doing this or that, or she's been doing this or that. That doesn't need to be said. So beware of this idea of, uh, well, I don't gossip. I just was making people aware of what's going on so they can pray. Maligning, criticizing people. See, all of those, all of those are arrogance. And what does arrogance do? That destroys your capacity for blessing, capacity to receive divine provision. You want, more, you want more than a thimble. Eventually, you want more than a pint. You want more than a gallon, uh, a, a quart, rather. You want the gallon jar. You want that to be overflowing. This is the Christian life. It's working to the point, doing what you need to do to be able to, to be the recipient of all the provisions God has for you. Now let's go back. Let's go back now and and pick up again. What we we started with number five above, and what we're going to do is pick up with that. And we're talking about number five was what is arrogance and how can identify it. Well, what we tried to do is to share some in, information here to help you to understand for your Christian life what arrogance is, because arrogance arrogance is. Listen, that was Satan's problem. Satan was arrogant. Hey, God, move over. I'm going to take over. I'm the most beautiful, the most wise creature that ever came from your hand, and I think I've got this thing together. Move over. I'm, I'm going to be just like you are. See, that's arrogance. That's arrogance. Well, what is arrogance? Arrogance is a mental attitude. It's what goes on in your head. Arrogance is a mental attitude sin, which overflows into the motivation and decision making and activity of, of the individual. So in your life, Arrogance is up something that happens in your head. It's a mental attitude sin. It comes from your old man or your old woman. It's a function of the old sin nature. Under the influence of the old sin nature. So arrogance is a mental attitude sin that overflows into motivation, which means then that your motivation is arrogance. Your decision. Why are you making these decisions? It's because I am arrogant. The activity, the production. So your motive, your your motivation. And what does motivation do? Motivation explains why I did or why I'm doing this sin. Why am I lying? Well, I'm arrogant. Why am I cheating? Why am I revengeful? Well, it's because I'm arrogant. You see, you're motivated. Arrogance motivates you 
Arrogance causes you or allows you to make decisions. Arrogance, arrogance is the reason why you're doing what I see you do, what I see you uh, see you doing. So arrogance is a mental attitude. Sin begins in the head, but it overflows into your motivation for doing something, your decision making. I'm going to do it anyway. And your activity. Arrogance is it arrogance includes four different concepts. Here again, these words, do we really understand? Do, does, does the world really understand what these words mean? Arrogance includes at least four concepts, egotism, vanity, pride, and conceit. Well, what is egotism? Oftentimes when you read the word, when, when you use the word egotism, all people hear is ego. And that's I centered. They say, well, yeah, it's all about you. See, they misunderstand because egotism is a good word. This is an this is an excessive preoccupation with self. That's not good. I said it was good, it's not good. Egotism is the, is an excessive preoccupation with self and must be distinguished from ego which is self-consciousness. And, and when I started to say that, these two words, egotism and ego, ego is a good word, egotism is not. Egotism is excessive preoccupation with self, but it must be distinguished from ego, which is self-consciousness and perfectly normal. In other words, I, we've, we've seen and heard people in times past who said, well, don't use the word I, don't use the word I, that's egotistical. No, using the word I, ego, is simply a recognition of the fact that you're alive and on planet Earth. It's self-consciousness. It's an aware, an awareness of the fact that you exist. So egotism, excessive preoccupation with self, vanity, that's arrogance. This is self-admiration and an excessive desire to be admired by others. Hence, vanity is easily flattered and patronized. Pride, that's arrogance. This is a this is lofty and arrogant assumption of superiority. That's what pride is. That's arrogance. Conceit. This is exaggerated estimate, an exaggerated estimate of one's abilities and attainments. So conceited. Oh look, look what I do. Look how good I am. Look what I have attained. Hmm. See, one final comment about arrogance. Arrogance is the only disease known to mankind, which makes everyone sick, except the one who is. Listen to that. Arrogance is the only disease known to mankind, which makes everyone sick. See, if you're arrogant, I'm sick of that. If I'm arrogant, you're sick of that. I'm sick of that. I'm sick of that. I'm sick of that person. So you're sick of me because I'm, I'm arrogant. So arrogance, make, my arrogance makes you sick. Arrogance is the only disease known to mankind that makes everyone sick except the one who has it. Hmm. Proverbs 21, 27, 1. We're talking about arrogance. Proverbs 20, 27, 1 says, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. What is being said here? Let's take that phrase, do not boast about tomorrow. What's the meaning of that phrase? Do not boast about tomorrow. It means do not depend on any future moment for the spiritual good for which you have need right now. Now let's slow down with that. You have a need right now, whatever that need is. You have a need for it. And it's for your spiritual good. But you say, eh, tell you what. I've got to do this over here and do that over there. Got something else to do. I'll tell you what, I'll do that later. So do not boast for tomorrow. What we're being told here is do not depend on any future moment for the spiritual good for which you have a need right now. That means don't delay. Look at sub point one. The first proverb in chapter 27 is this. 
Do not boast for tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. See, this first proverb in chapter 27 warns against procrastination. You have a need right now. It's for your spiritual benefit. It's for your spiritual good. But something else is distracting you over here. And you're going to take the time to do this over here before you get about meeting your need, doing what you need to have your need met. So the first proverb in, in chapter 27 warns against procrastination. For example, no one can be sure. You cannot be sure of what the next day will bring you. You may not have a next day. The rapture may occur. You may go home to be with the Lord. If you, if you are an unbeliever, you may not go to be with the Lord. You may be on your way to that place in the belly of the earth called hell, where you will remain until the great white throne judgment, and then you're going to spend eternity in the lake of fire simply because you procrastinated. You heard the gospel. But you said, eh, eh, somebody's around here, and I don't want them to see me walk the aisle. No, we're not walking the aisle for salvation. But you know what I mean. They're embarrassed to become a Christian in front of so-and-so over here, so I'll just delay that. But you see, you cannot be sure of what the next day may bring. You don't know what the next hour may bring. You don't know what the next minute may bring. You do not know what the next second may bring. Therefore, true wisdom is not to trust the future day, the future hour, the future minute, the future second, for it may never come, nor are, you, are we to dwell in the past. See, while it is today, we as Christians must live today. We must act today and leave nothing undone that can be done today. Do not wait till tomorrow to get the right thing done today. Or this hour. Or this next minute. Or the next second. second. Okay. I have a question. How true is this of salvation? <laughs> I got the gospel. I'm going to give you the gospel in just a second. Now, I got to go over here. But as soon as I get back, that'll be fine. You go back over there, you never come back again. See, how true is this of salvation, which is offered today? Now is the day of salvation. Today, now, not next week, not next month, not the next hour, right now. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the hour, the minute, the second of salvation. And how many people have been lost forever by procrastination, by thinking that a more convenient time would come for me to get saved? Well, wait a minute. I don't want to get saved in the checkout line at Kroger. No, wait a minute. I don't want to get saved at the ballpark. No, I don't want to get. I don't want to get saved at, at high school. I don't want to get saved in the classroom. No, I don't want to get saved wherever. Okay. How many people are lost forever by procrastination by thinking, ah, oh, no, I tell you what, I'd rather be able to. I'd rather get that done in the church next Sunday. So I'll come to church next Sunday, and when the, when the invitation is given, I will come forward and give my life to Christ. What? How many people have been lost forever by procrastination, by thinking that there's a more convenient time that would come? What, is, what are we being told here? Do not boast about tomorrow. Hey, I'll get it done tomorrow. Yeah, big deal. You don't know what that day may bring. Someone has said, listen to this, someone has said, not sure who it is, but it's a, it's a comment that was made, statement that was made, written, I saw it, I said, wow, this fits. The thief which cheats you of your days, giving you false information, see, the thief which steals your days, which cheats you of your days and beggars us of our wealth. What's that mean? Here you are, you're a wealthy person. The beggar comes up and says, I need something, you give it to him. So I need some more, I give, give it to him. I need, I need something else. Oh, you, I, I want you to do this, I want you to do that. See, begging, I want you to do this, I want you to do that. Wait a minute, you should be getting saved, you should be doing what God wants you, but I'm begging you, go this way, go that way, go some other way. The thief which cheats you 
of your days. See, we're to make we're to make meaning out of every moment, every second, every hour, every day. In the spiritual battle called the ends of the come. This is what life is all about. This is what the Christian way of life is all about. But the thief, that, that person out there that's distracting you, getting you go some go some other way. What are they, what are they, what are they stealing from you? They're stealing from you your day. The day that you have, the hour, the second, the minute that you have that God gave you to be what we need to be on planet Earth at this point in time in the angelic conflict. So the thief cheats you and the beggar comes up and begs for your wealth, begs, begs us of our wealth in the spacious. See, that word spacious means malicious, deceptive thought that tomorrow belongs to you. The thief says, hey, I'll tell you what, let's let do this. No, I need to, I know I need to do this. I've got to get this done. This is God's plan for my life. No, no, come on over here. That'll be okay. Do that tomorrow. And it'll like only be about an hour. Then you get back to that again. No, no, not at all. The person who begs you of your wealth, that's all that God has provided. Begging you for it, begging you for it. In other words, taking it away from you. Oh, it's okay, you get back to that thing tomorrow. No, it'll about next week. That'll be okay. Someone has said the thief which cheats us of our days and beggars us of our wealth is the specious, the malicious, deceptive thought that tomorrow belongs to us. No, it's today, one day at a time. It doesn't say one tomorrow at a time. It says one day at a time. James in, in chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, gives us the same lesson. And this same lesson is a warning against boasting, a warning against arrogant boasting. James says, now listen to me, you that say, hey, today or tomorrow, yeah, we'll travel to a certain city where we will stay a year and go into business and make a lot of money. James says, you don't even know what your life tomorrow will be. And you're telling me, hey, today or tomorrow, we'll travel to a certain city and we'll stay a year and go into business and make a lot of money. James said, hold it. You don't even know what your life will be tomorrow. You are like a puff of smoke. You've seen it. There it goes. See that puff of smoke goes up in the air and whoop, it just dissipates. He said, your life, you, your life is like a puff of smoke, which appears for a moment and then disappears. Oh, here you are, whoop it, and gone, gone. What you should say is this, if the Lord is willing, we will live and do this or that. But now you are, now you are proud and you boast. All such boasting, he says, is wrong. So then, if we do not do the good we know we should do, we're guilty of sin. Uh oh, hold it now. What that means is when the thief comes in and steals your time, when the beggar takes your wealth away, stealing those things from you, we're not doing the good we know that we should do. James says from God, we're guilty of sin. How about Proverbs 27.1? Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. That first phrase, for you do not know what a day may bring. Here's the principle. What does that mean? What's the principle that we get from this? Principles, promises, doctrines, techniques, rules for living. Here's a principle. Do not delay the day. See, it says, for you do not know what a day may bring. Do not delay the day. But take the opportunity to use the day. See, delay the day. God gives you this day. You see, eh, I've got these other things I'm going to do. I'm going to get out here and do this. And I'll come back later. Do not delay the day. What does God want you to do today? What does he want you to do this hour? What does he want you to do this minute? What should you be doing right now? Do not delay the day. But take the opportunity to use the day. How? To fulfill God's purpose, his plan and will for your life when the day is offered to you. Well, 
Last night at midnight, I was awake. One second after midnight was a new day. I said, well, it's here, here, Lord, so what do you do? You take that day and you use it to fulfill God's purpose, plan, and will for your life when that day is offered to you. Do not boast about tomorrow. Well, I'll get that done tomorrow. Now, point eight. This, we're probably not going to have time to get through this. This is an amazing passage of scripture. Point eight. This is the eighth of the nine things. The dynamics of daily living. The dynamics. Wow, you know, dyna, dynamite. Ooh, the explosion. The dynamics of daily living must be related to the metabolization of doctrine. So if you want your days to be dynamic, if I want my days to be dynamic, we need to focus on what God's plan is for our life. Proverbs 25, 5 says, who? David says, lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you, I wait all the day. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you, I wait all the day. What is David saying here? David wrote Psalm 25 after his encounter with a day-by-day -day life at the caves of En Gedi. Now listen to that. David wrote Psalm 25. We're talking about Psalm 25, verse 5. Psalm wrote, David wrote this entire Psalm 25 after he had encountered his day-by-day -day life in the caves at the caves of En Gedi. So David's in these caves. And he writes this psalm after his encounter of that day-by-day -day life while he was at those caves in Get uh, of En Gedi. And we're in Psalm 25, but you, if you go back to 1 Samuel 24, verses 1 through 7, this provides the background for Psalm 25. How can we understand what, what David is telling us in this 25th Psalm if we don't understand what he was talking about in 1 Samuel 24, 1 through 7? So let's read this entire passage very quickly, and this will be the background for Psalm 25, verse 5. It says, now when, when Saul, that's King Saul, when he returned from pursuing the Philistines, it was reported to him saying, behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to search for David and his men in front of the rocks of the mountain goats. Now, here's the issue. King Saul is in reversionism. This is going to come up probably on Wednesday. King Saul is in reversionism. He's upset with David. He's just come back from war against the Philistines. And God allowed reversionists to King Saul, the king of Israel, to win that battle and come back to Israel you be told that David's out there in the wilderness, and he's going to take 3,000 men. He's going to go chase down David and kill him. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men, verse 2, from all of Israel. And what did he do? It says, it went to search for David and his men in front of the rocks of the mountains, of, uh, the mountain goats. And that's, that's just another term for En Gedi. A location. And he, that's King Saul, and he came to the sheepfolds on the way where there was a cave. Now the sheepfolds is a uh, it's a, a part of the uh, a part of the terrain that was built up in such a way that you could house sheep in there. And this is where this is where King Saul came to. He came to the sheepfolds on the way where there was a cave. And Saul went in to relieve himself. I don't know that I've read this in the past. I had no idea what this. I, I didn't take time to realize what that was saying. Saul saw this cave and he went in to relieve himself. We'll talk about that. 
Now, David and his men were sitting in the inner recesses of the cave. So here's King Saul. He said, man, he said, I got to the bathroom. Oh, there's a cave. I'll go in here and leave myself. So he goes in the cave, but doesn't realize that David and his men are in that same cave. But David, but King Saul just goes into the cave, in the front part of the cave, to relieve himself. But David and his men are way back in the back, in, in the recesses of that cave. So Saul said, I'm going in here to relieve myself. Now David and his men were sitting in the inner recesses of the cave. Then David's men said to him, knowing that knowing that King Saul is out there in the front part of this cave, relieving himself, using the bathroom there. And David's men that are with him are going to tell David something about what he ought to do with King Saul. Said then David, David's men said to him, Behold, this is the day which the Lord said to you. See, the Lord had said something to David, and, they, and the, his, the people that are with him say, Hey, David, this is the day. This is the day. But what did God say? He said, Behold, God's saying to David, Behold, I am about to hand your enemy. Uh-oh, that might be King Saul. These men heard that, that knew what God had told David. Boy, he's out there. He's got his back turned. Whoo! This is the time, David. Get in and do it. Behold, I I am about to, to hand uh, hand or your enemy over to you, and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. So David's men say, Hey, David, this is the time, buddy. Get out there and whack him. Get out there and kill him. So what did David do? Then David got up and cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly. There's Here's, picture it. Here is Solomon, or Saul rather, relieving himself. David sneaks up behind him, could have killed him. But instead of killing, he just takes something and cuts the back part of his robe and slips away. But it came about after afterward that David's conscience bothered, conscience bothered him because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. We'll see next Wednesday why that's true. So he said to his men, far be it from me because of the Lord that I would, see, because the Lord, that's God, far be it from me because of the Lord that I would do this thing to my Lord, that's Saul, uh, Saul rather. And he says, he goes on to say that I would do this thing to my Lord, King Saul, the Lord's anointed, that Saul, to reach out my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. We'll talk about that. And David rebuked his men with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul got up. He relieved himself. Didn't even know that David had been there or the men were in, in that cave. Didn't know that David had cut off part of his robe. He got up, he left the cave, and went on his way. Now remember, we're talking about boasting, we're talking about arrogance. And David wrote in Psalm 25, after his encounter, his day by life, day by day, day by day life in the caves of Yeti, and this is what he said: Lead me, O Lord, lead me in your truth, and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you, I wait all the day. This is what he said after that encounter with King Saul in that cave in En Gedi. We'll pick up this coming Wednesday and move on from this. Uh, I will send out an email this afternoon inviting you to our next week's session, Bible Class Fellowship Luncheon at American Pythesa. God bless you today. Father, what a what a blessing your word is giving us insight into what the christian way of life is really all about may we not boast may we not be arrogant may we not put off till tomorrow what we need what we need to do today but lord i only have just a few hours to get this done no he says look he said i've given you this day if you think what you're about to do is good and wonderful 
as a distraction from my will. You can't bless. You can't believe what's going to happen to you and the blessings you'll have in eternity future. Wait until then to get that kind of blessing. Right now, do my will for your life. I will bless you there. I will bless you in that. Father, I pray we get a good picture of what the Christian way of life is and continue to live it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, folks. For everyone online with me, Facebook and WebEx, see you this coming Wednesday.